Good evening, everyone. That last song that we sang was about Mark Twain's uh, sojourn in the twin cities of Vanity and Pride in Missouri. About the years he spent in Vanity and Pride. I think everybody's at the fair tonight. Well, they wish they were now. It was a busy day this morning. Good day. Um, continue to uh, pray for our sister, Pat, uh, if you would, as she came forward this morning and is beginning her radiation treatments this week. Um, also, um, we haven't mentioned it uh, today specifically, but uh, for David and Connie Surgent, they both have some uh, upcoming uh, health situations, and um, he's, he has an appointment on the 1st of May, I think, for a consult. And then just a few days after that, Connie has uh, uh, an appointment about her eye. Oh, her heart cath. Okay. That's next week. I've, I've got to check my calendar and make sure I've got all those down correctly. Because I'm, <laughs> I tell you, it's, um, you go through spells. Have you noticed that? You go through spells and all of a sudden we have, you know, 10 people on the prayer list with very serious things, and then you go through a spell where, you know, somebody's got a splinter, and that's all you hear about. And then all of a sudden, here it comes again, and um, sometimes families are, are hit at the same time, like David and Connie are uh, facing right now, so we want to remember uh, their family and, and all of those who've requested um, our petitions before the Father in prayer. Tonight, we're going to venture into the there we go. The world of the pastoral epistles, and we'll kind of explain what that means here in just a moment. Our first one being First Timothy. Would you pray with me, please? Holy Father, we thank you for the day you've given us, and we thank you for the blessings of this day. We're grateful for the beautiful weather. We're grateful, Father, for the warm hearts and the willing spirits who have met in this place today to encourage each other and to place you on the highest place. Father, we ask you to continue to be with our sister Pat as she's facing radiation treatments. We know that she is one tough lady, and we know that she has struggled and, and overcome with your strength before, and we pray that you would continue to strengthen her as she fights this cancer. And for brother-in-law of Chris, we pray that you would be with him and his family, be with the doctors and those who are attending to them, that their situation would be, um, that the decision would be easy to make, whatever that decision is, and that it would bring about a restoration of his health. And Father, for everyone who is facing appointments and follow-ups and tests and so many things that are present, this time in our congregation's life, Father, we ask you to act on their behalf in your mercy and in your grace. Be tender and comforting to them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The pastoral letters of First and Second Timothy and Titus are called pastoral because Paul is pastoring these evangelists. He is shepherding them. And he's helping to raise them up and encourage them in their works of ministry. And so these are very personal letters that are written between the Apostle Paul and these two evangelists. But there is so much in there that continues to be of incredible benefit to us down to this particular time. Just mentioned the Apostle Paul is our author, and it appears to be after his first imprisonment in Rome, somewhere around 64, that he writes this uh, particular letter. Timothy, uh, the evangelist, is at Ephesus. He had been left behind to serve the congregation uh, there. We have uh, the purpose primarily is to encourage Timothy to be a godly example to exercise his spiritual gifts 
and also to uh, for Paul to give guidance to him in his duties as the the preacher, the located evangelist there in Ephesus. Our key verse is 1 Timothy 3.15. But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Now, we could spend weeks and weeks just on that one verse. Uh, because it is exceptionally rich. But this kind of gives us the idea of why it is, and it's right here in the middle of the letter, why Paul is writing to Timothy. And he, along the way, he will say, I'm writing to you, I am writing to you, I am writing to you. And so this is carried out throughout this particular letter. Now, in this particular letter, there are a number of things that are of critical importance. When you get into chapter 2, we see that he has inspired uh, the inspired command to pray for men everywhere, for our leaders, for those in responsibilities, to pray for them everywhere. I saw a poll earlier today on a preacher's site that I'm a uh, part of. And I try best not to comment on it because it usually ends up becoming an argument. I know that that blows everybody's view of preachers, but that's just how it works out. Because we have preachers from the non-institutional background all the way to the very progressive folks on this preacher site. And shots are fired, and the next thing you know, here it goes. And so I try to stay out of it. And people will put polls on there. And they put polls on there. I mean, it's like they're prodding people into arguing. It's irritating. And, and one of these days, I'm going to write a book about it and just mail it to everybody on the list. I don't know what I'm going to do. But it was, it was about our military. And it said, should we pray for our military? I'm a pacifist. Should we pray for our military? And one guy gets on there and says, well, I'm a pacifist too, but we shouldn't pray for our military to the exclusion of praying for all military because there are Christians in all armies. And somebody comes there and says, I don't think ISIS has any Christians in it. And then it was just on from there, you know. When it says pray for, you know what? I've prayed for ISIS. Have you? Should you? Did Jesus tell us to pray for our enemies? Sure did. That's a hard prayer to pray, let me tell you. Pray for Al-Qaeda. Pray for anybody that is construed as an enemy nationally. We're supposed to pray for them. For those who are our enemies personally, we're supposed to pray for them. We're supposed to pray for kings and people in authority. Kings, plural. That doesn't mean just Nero who was the king of that empire. We're to pray for whoever the dictator in North Korea is this week, or Venezuela, or Cuba, just like we pray for the president of, of the United States and our senators and representatives and governors and mayors and councilmen. We're to pray for them as we have opportunity. And so Paul starts chapter 2 by talking about that, and then he gets into the importance of women keeping their proper place in the public assembly of the church. He goes into the characteristics of the man who is qualified to serve as an elder, the characteristics of the one who is qualified to serve as a deacon. He, Following that, he says, I'm writing these things so you might know how to conduct yourself in the house of God, the temple. And he continues to go through and, and each time he, he goes through, he says, I'm writing to you, I'm writing to you, I'm writing to you. But I don't want to stray too far away from the beginning. And so I would like for you to join me in the first two verses. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment, of God our Savior and the Lord Jesus Christ our hope 
to Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. I would like for us to consider for just a moment our hope. Jesus Christ, our hope. Because he is our hope. There, there is a, a very simple but profound song. Uh, it's about 20 or 25 years old now. My only hope is you. you. Anybody know that song besides me? A few of us do. My only hope is you. Jesus, my only hope is you. From early in the morning till late at night, my only hope is you. We have, if he's, if he's not there, we're done. That's it. We have nothing. He is our hope. And so let's look in this letter. We'll bounce around this letter just a little bit to see how this is presented to us. The word hope, and it's always good to define what you're talking about, is favorable and confident expectation relative to the future and the unseen. The key word in that definition is expectation. I have, that's the dictionary version of the Bible word. Mine is an earnest expectation. It's something that we expect to happen that we have not yet seen. Now, Paul describes in Romans chapter 8, hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one hope for what he sees? You know, Gene's sitting right there right now, and he's going, you know, I hope I get to go to church tonight. Is that what he's saying? Why would he say that? He's already here. Now, he might have hoped that earlier this afternoon, and he may have thought he was going to get caught up doing something and not be able to be here. might have said, I hope I get to be assembled with the saints at church tonight. But now that he's here, why would he hope for that? It would make no sense. So, it is a future. Now, our hope, when we talk about hopes of Christians, our hopes are predicated on the promises of God. That is the only reason that we have an earnest expectation with regard to hope. Because God has promised and God cannot lie. That is, that's all we've got. Now, I don't believe that's blind faith by any stretch of the imagination because God has proved himself over and over and over again. But it does require a a tremendous amount of faith to understand hope in that context. Now that uh, it's been a long time since, I don't use the example quite so much, but uh, maybe a few of you will remember a man by the name of Ed McMahon and uh, how everybody used to sit by their landline waiting for him to call. Because you may have won the Publishers Clearinghouse sweepstakes, right? And we, we would hope that Ed McMahon would call us. Well, Ed McMahon's no longer with us. And of course, if you didn't subscribe to their magazines, you didn't have any hope anyway. But that was more of a wish because there was no expectation involved in that that was predicated upon a promise that was foundation on an unlying, always faithful God. In 1 Timothy, there are three aspects of hope that the Apostle Paul addresses. The first is, Christ is the reason for our hope. First and foremost, right out of the chute, verse 1, he lets us know that. And why, why is he our hope? Well, when you get to verse 15, we read, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Jesus Christ Excuse me, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now, we can talk about him being the chief of sinners and we can talk about faithful sayings. We can talk about a lot of things here, but the thing I want us to focus on is he came into the world. That means he was not from or of this world. But yet he came to this world to be a savior. What was his purpose? To save sinners. Jesus himself in Luke 19.10, the Son of Man has come to seek 
and to save that which was lost. Hebrews chapter 9, 27 and 28. The Hebrew writer tells us regarding Jesus. And it is appointed for men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly await for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. So he came into the world to save sinners, and when he came into the world, he was offered once for all. Backing up to chapter 7, verse 25, Therefore he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus is the reason for our hope. Now, when Jesus was born, it was declared that he was the hope of Israel. The difficulty was that most people's hope of Israel had to do with the physical and not the spiritual. They were looking for a physical deliverer, a physical person on a physical white horse coming in and physically running the Romans out and physically reestablishing the throne of David. That's how, that was their concept of Messiah that they had passed along generationally through their teachings. There may have been those who came along from time to time that understood it in the spiritual context, but that would have been the vast exception rather than the rule. Even his apostles who spent three and a half years with him in Acts chapter 1 said, Will you now at this time restore your kingdom to Israel? They were still looking. They still didn't understand. They thought, well, okay, well, you defeated death. Now you can get the Romans out of here. They didn't understand. But Jesus is the reason that we have hope. There is no other. Someone made the statement. It may have been Denny. I can't remember who it was. But someone made the statement. I think it was last week in one of our classes that Jesus dying on the cross was plan A and there was no plan B. Was that you, Denny, that made that statement last week? I can't remember who it was. Somebody put your hand up so I can make give you credit. Okay, you all failed. Um, <laughs> but so, somebody made the statement because it's true. Q on Thursday night. Okay, it was Thursday night in our Thursday night class. There we go. That's why it sounded so familiar, right? Because you're the one that said it. But there was no plan B. There wasn't a backup plan. This is it. And Jesus won. We talk about the victory that we have in Jesus. Jesus was victorious over death. And because he was victorious over death, we too can have a victory. And therefore, we hope for his coming. We anticipate with expectation the return of Christ. Because he promised he was coming back. He promised to go and prepare a place. He promised to come back. And he promised to receive us to himself. That we could be where he is forever. Jesus is the reason for our hope. Secondly. Real hope in contrast to. Something quite different. Chapter 6. 17 through 19. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Let them do good, that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. What is the problem that he is contrasting here hope in christ versus the the uncertainty of material riches paul knew the people in ephesus he had spent a great deal of time with them and he understood that there were certain individuals there that had a little bit more trust in their bank account than they did in god and their hope was futile in their material possessions god 
gives you material possessions to take care of your circumstances of life. And he gives you material possessions so that you may do good. To be rich in good works. Not seeking anything in return. And in doing so, verse 19 says, storing up a good foundation for the time to come. Material riches are uncertain. Matthew 6, 19 through 21, store up your treasures in heaven, not on earth where moths eat and and rust uh, sets in and thieves break in and steal. You know, everything we have is going to be gone one day. It's just going to be gone. No matter what it is, no matter what it is made of, it will all be gone. Even this right here, leather and paper, not the word of God that is contained within, but the physical book itself will be destroyed one day, either through time or through the ultimate fire that burns everything up. Everything, this building, the new building, should the Lord will that we have that completed and get moved into it your vehicles your homes your clothes the place of your work all of it's going to go away so we can't trust in those things we can't truly have hope in those things but we thank god for the blessing of those things and we want to use them to his honor and glory material riches are uncertain and our hope and our trust is in God nor to trust in uncertain riches but in the living God that's where our trust is that's where our hope is found Jesus is our reason for hope and we compare that hope with the hope that many have in their material blessings and you see that there is no comparison none whatsoever and lastly what is the response of our hope. Look at chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. The response of our hope, first and foremost, is the labor of love. Our work in the kingdom is a labor of love, and sometimes it becomes drudgery. When it does, we need to back up, and we need to reexamine it, and we need to refresh, and we need to get ready to prepare for our labor to once again be a labor of love. Sometimes we can accept too much on ourselves. Sometimes we can allow others to discourage us. We can allow circumstances to discourage us, and all of a sudden it becomes drudgery. And our work is not a labor of love, and it is certainly not a sweet-smelling aroma that goes up to God under those circumstances. But when we find our passion, and when we understand the importance of whatever it is, whether it's teaching the two- and the three-year-old, or whether it's spreading gravel in the parking lot, whatever it is, when we do it as a labor of love and it is a passion to us, that changes everything. It is a sweet-smelling aroma that goes up to God. It is a sacrifice that goes to Him. There are so many little, bitty, tiny things that happen in the kingdom that no one takes notice of but God. And God is glorified in those things. And when I say little, bitty, tiny, almost imperceptible things, that is to us. Because they're extremely meaningful to God. Everything. Whether it's bending up and picking up a gum wrapper in the parking lot. No matter what it is. We almost had an accident this morning. My wife's boyfriend lost his mommy. (laughs) The Conwitz number 10 comes crying up the sidewalk 
that beautiful blonde curly hair. I can't find my mommy. And I thought, well, if Susie was here, he wouldn't care. He brings gifts to her, flowers. All, that's why I said it's her boyfriend. He brought something to eat. I think it was Mother's Day. And he gave it to me and uh, to give to you, because I think you were sick. It was Mother's Day, whenever it was. When was it? When you were in North Carolina, that's when it was. And, and I, I said, so is this for me and Miss Susie? He goes, no, that's for Miss Susie. But there's a little child, and he's scared because he can't find his mom. And I picked him up, and I said, let's go find your mom. And I turn around, and Jolene is standing there, and she goes, you finish what you're doing. I'll take care of him. And she grabs him. And so everybody's fighting for this precious little child to take him to his mom. Now, isn't that a good thing to fight over? And you know we're not fighting, but we're struggling to see who gets I mean, it's just a little bit. That, that is an insignificant thing in the overall life of the church, but it meant the world to that young child. Now, how do you keep up with 11 kids, man? You're a, you're a genius. I'm just telling you. It's not you. It, it's Heather. Okay. Well, she's a genius. Well, she has to be. She married you, right? Okay. But, you know, it, all these little bitty things have to be a labor of love. We have to have a passion for people and a passion for the things of the Lord. And whatever it is, wherever your avenue is. You know, Anthony came in and talked to the elders, and I happened to be in on the meeting when he started proposing this idea about this financial freedom class. And you could see in his eyes, this was something he's passionate about, wanting to help people because they had found themselves in debt and knew what the struggle was, and, and they have now uh, been able to correct that. And they're wanting to help others work through their financial situation. Tuesday night class, uh, it, I tell you, especially younger couples, but any couple that they're having struggles, that Dave Ramsey material is top-notch. As a matter of fact, a young man, he's not a young man anymore, he's probably about 40 or 42 now, who was in my youth group in North Carolina many, many moons ago, is works for Dave Ramsey. His name is Travis Henry. He's a member of the church at the Mount Juliet Church of Christ right outside of Nashville. And he works for Dave Ramsey. Um, good material, but Anthony's passionate about that. And, you know, whatever it is that you're, let it be a labor of love. Don't let it be grudging. Don't let it be, you know, kicking the dirt and kicking and screaming the whole way. No, find something you're passionate about in the kingdom. There's much work to do. But at the same time, the response of our hope sometimes is reproach and suffering in the temporary. suffering and reproach you know there are going to be times that our labor of love is going to lead us into conflict with the world and when it does get ready get ready but you know when we suffer reproach and when we endure hardship for the sake of the kingdom of God that, that's like a blip on the radar of eternity. It hardly even shows up. Because we know that once that passes and we're in our eternal home, when Christ, who is our hope, appears, we won't even be thinking about that. That'll be so far in our rearview mirror that we won't even be giving that a second thought. Jesus is the reason for our hope. We need to keep our focus on him. Colossians chapter 127, this is a passage that I have preached many times. I don't know that I have preached it here, but it is a verse that I find to be very encouraging for me personally. As the Apostle Paul is writing in the previous verses about becoming a minister and uh, how he was opening up a, minis uh, a mystery of 
what had been hidden before, letting people know what is happening now to them. These are things to be revealed to the saints. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Is that a, a wish? Or is that an earnest expectation? Christ in you. Paul writing to Timothy says he is our in Hebrews chapter 6 probably one of the most well known passages on hope and we'll conclude with this let's back up to verse 17 thus God determining to show more abundantly the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel that is it was unchangeable confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever according to the order of of Melchizedek this hope we have as an anchor for the soul and it is a hope that God and his unchangeableness has promised and God cannot lie and we have several songs which we sing regularly that speak of we have an anchor and that anchor is Jesus Christ he is our hope and he is our forerunner who has gone on before us so that he can prepare a place for us to enjoy that for which we hope. We long for that eternal glory. But for now, it's hope. The Apostle Paul concludes his chapter 13 the chapter of love that he writes in 1 Corinthians, he concludes it with now abide these three, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. But Mark, you just preached about this great hope. Well, let me make it a little clearer for you. For now we walk by faith and not by sight. But there's going to come a day that we walk by sight and no longer by faith in eternal glory. There will be no need for faith when faith becomes sight. Now we walk in hope, an earnest expectation of a glory that awaits us. And one day we will no longer hope because that glory will be ours. But that agape love of God will endure forever. It will abide forever. And so this great hope, we walk in faith, not by sight. We live in this earnest expectation of something greater that is coming. But the greatest is love. And we need to understand that God loved us more than anything. He gave the best he had, his son, to die for us. And through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, we now have that hope. That earnest expectation of something our minds cannot even possibly our brother's prepared a song for us. Talks about he loves me. And yes, he does. He loves us more than we can possibly imagine. Tonight, if you're here and you need encouragement, you need prayers, you're facing difficulties in your life, we want to help you. We want to pray with you and pray for you and encourage you in any way that we can. Or if you happen to be here tonight and you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ and put him on in baptism, would you please let us know that? We'd love to assist you with that as well. But whatever your need is, please don't wait. Won't you come as together we stand and sing?